pretty much known Christ my whole life. I just grew up in church, loving God, worshiping God. But as I got older, I realized that it was kind of just religion and going through the routines of going to church. But my relationship with Jesus didn't actually come to any types of, of substance until I was in my late 20s. And that was right around the time my husband got offered a job here in Pittsburgh. And when we came here to Victory, it was just like God was handing us the next puzzle piece and the next step. I think I was on the fence, a little hesitant, but I joined a small group. It was just like exactly what I needed in that season. God was showing me that the connection around me, I, I wasn't alone and that I didn't have to do this alone and that there were other women out there who could, you know, pray over me and speak God's word over me. And so that's what we started to do was we would pray for each other and speak God's word over each other. And it just began to, to be like normal. I couldn't not be in a small group after that because I needed that connection. It's just so amazing. God is so faithful. And so I just encourage anyone who's thinking about it, do it. It's, it's awesome. You know, when I hear Janelle's story, it, it absolutely thrills my heart because it shows you what happens when you connect and you get connected to God's people and you get in a small group. It shows you what happens when, when you take a spiritual next step in your life. All of us have next steps in our spiritual life. And, uh, and today, it's my hope that you'll really take a next step and, and, uh, and, and really just lean into small groups. In fact, we're going to talk about that somewhat today in, in the message. But, you know, but we, this is the third and final week uh, before we enter into three weeks of just an incredible time of celebration. I mean, the next three weeks are going to be remarkable. You'll laugh, you'll cry. It's going to be remarkable. But, uh, but we're, we've been teaching a series about 2020 vision how to have 20-20 vision from God in a world that is entirely out of focus. And I think it's safe to say that we live in a world that's crazy and out of focus. I mean, I don't think anybody in any, from any background would not look at this world and say, it's crazy, it's out of focus, but as a Christian, as a child of God, God has given you the ability to have a 20-20 vision in the midst of the crazy. So you're gonna see in today's message, this simple thing, I want you, this is my heart today. I want you to see how small groups play a massive role. Say out loud, massive. Yes. I really want you to get this, a massive role in you helping you reflect the image of God and helping you to obtain God's 2020 vision for your life. In order to get that, you have to understand this, that God has a 2020 vision for your relational life. Our relationships are everything. Really, that's the image of God in us is relational. So the quality of your life and my life will never rise above the level of the image of God revealed, listen, and experienced in your relationships or your relational life. So I want to leave you with a takeaway today throughout this message. This is your takeaway, and it's this, that we need one another to be made whole and fully reflect his image in our life. We need, it isn't optional, like you need oxygen, we need one another to be made whole and to fully reflect his image in our life. Now, when you hear the word made whole, it, 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 it's part of a word called holy. What does it mean for a Christian to be holy? Because that's really kind of an intimate. How many of you ever felt intimidated by this statement? Be holy, God. God says, be holy as I am holy. It's like, okay. Anybody, is that a little intimidating to you? How about if, if you understood it this way? I want you to reflect the fullness of my image in you. And to the degree that my image is reflected in you, you will be like me or holy. See, the image of God is designed to liberate you in life, not, not, not limit you. And, and I really believe that God's going to do something great in your heart today. Because we're going to talk about some things that, that, that are so controversial in our world today. Now, here's, here's what I'm going to ask for everybody. I'm going to cover some things that are cover sexuality, gender issues, uh, uh, homosexuality, uh, heterosexual issues. I'm going to be talking about some things, but here's, here's what my request. Stay till the service is over and give me a chance to thoroughly offend you. Okay? 
What I'm saying is that, no, I don't believe you'll be offended if you don't stop in the middle. But because sometimes in our culture, people hear something, they fill in the blanks and then they move on. Please let, the, let, let me finish what I'm trying to share. Then you can make a decision of whether you're happy, unhappy, say, you know, uh, take a hike or whatever. But, uh, but please give me that opportunity today. You're here. Let God do something great in your heart. A couple summers ago, Michelle and I celebrated our, 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 our 30th anniversary. And then we were also celebrating the 25th anniversary of the church being founded. And she turned 50 all within a, a few month period of time. So we did a, a vacation trip of a lifetime. We went to Italy, then we went to, to Greece, and then we went to, to, to France, France, and it was remarkable. And we were in Paris. Now, one of the things we did in Paris, would, if you ever go to Paris, I would really suggest that you go to the Louvre or Louvre or Louvre. Louvre, Louvre, Louvre. I don't, you know, my kids tease me that anytime I try to do an accent, jokingly, they said, Dad, it's like you're degrading that, that culture every time you do it. And I said, well, honey, everything I've ever learned was like either from a cartoon or a television show. Like my French accent came from Inspecteur Clisseau. <laughs> How many of you have no idea who Inspecteur Clisseau is? The Pink Panther. Anyway, so we're in Paris and we went to the Louvre. And um, anyway, if, if you don't know the, that old, those old movies, it's anyway. So we're at the Louvre. And the Louvre is this unbelievable building. You've got to go see this. It's the largest residence ever built on planet Earth to this day. It's almost 800,000 square feet. Now think about that. And it is magnificent. Every room you walk into, it, it'll take, it takes your breath away. It, it's so overwhelming. You just, and I have to tell you, walking through it was, was one of, it was, it was memorable. Well, in the Louvre is the Melissa. And I say, well, that's not a good French accent. Well, watch the movie. Anyway, so Mona's there. Now, the Mona Lisa, which I thought was kind of interesting, is probably at least a third smaller than this. And, uh, you know, I, I, you know it, it's Da Vinci's uh, uh, most famous painting. It's maybe, it, I think without exception, the most, we could say the most famous painting to man, known to man. People who know art, people who don't know art, Everybody knows about the Mona Lisa. So, but when you go to see the Mona Lisa in the Louvre, it's, it's kind of a weird room. You go in and there's 100, 200, 300 people and they're just kind of stacked like you'd be in the back of a crowd. Slowly they, they fade away and it takes you about 15 minutes to get up to the front in the Louvre and you get to look at the Mona Lisa. You're looking at her and she's behind this sheet of glass and it's just her on this blank wall. And it's, and it's kind of, anticlimactic because it's just you, you can't get close to her and and so so here's what I want to here's what I want to ask you to consider you see I grew up Italian grew up in a really ethnic area where most everybody had dark hair and brown eyes and so I grew up you know as an Italian I, I have green eyes so I'm one of the exceptions but I, I you know I, what if what if today in all honesty this was the actual Mona Lisa and they had sent it to us on loan today. And they trusted me with it. But I said, now this is Da Vinci's masterpiece. This is made in his image. And it's, it's protected by glass. And do you know why it's protected by glass? In 1956, a man named Hugo Villegas threw a rock at Mona and hit her right in the, in the elbow and it chipped the paint off. And as a result of that, it's not just glass, it's bulletproof glass. And so in two other times throughout the history, even since then, as late as 2009, somebody's tried to damage this painting. And it was, it was international news. And so the Mona Lisa's image, now listen, her image is protected by bulletproof glass because to alter this image, fully altering it, not jokingly like I'm about to do, but for real, would absolutely be international news. So being Italian, and let's just say, for the sake of our discussion, I like blue eyes. And so Mona, you know, she's, I, let's just, let's give her some blue eyes. And so let's imagine if I wanted to alter the image of the Mona Lisa, and I'm not crazy about Da Vinci's image. I like, I want to have somebody with blue eyes. I grew up with, you know, all Italian people, dark hair, dark eyes. 
I'm going to have this in my house. She's going to have her some blue eyes. So Mona now has some blue eyes. How many of you think Mona looks okay with blue eyes? I don't think so, but I've defaced this. But here's what I want to ask you about God. And this is so important, really, that I want you to get. So let me get my thing straight here. And I want you to understand the simple, simple thing is this. If this is Da Vinci's masterpiece, protected by bulletproof glass, you are God's masterpiece made in his image. And he wants his image to be unaltered. He wants his image in you to be unaltered. In our culture today, this would be considered criminal. In fact, you'd go to prison. But people mar the image of God over and over again and make a God in their image and not understanding. And my hope today is that you actually see what it means to have the image of God in your life and how it, how it will truly change the way you see your relationship with God. Now, God's relational image is revealed in the Bible in three basic areas. And I'm going to talk about some things that are, please hear me to the end. Because I'm going to go through some stuff right now and you're going to be hanging out there if, if you have a different perspective. So please stick with me. But God revealed his masterpiece. God himself. I don't think we actually can grasp that the God of the universe made you in his likeness and image. You are his masterpiece. And he revealed in you his image in three basic ways. One is gender. God's image in gender, then God's image in marriage, and then God's image reproduced. These three things I quickly want to show you before we move on. God's image in gender, Genesis 1 27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. If you're going to understand the full image of God unaltered, you have to realize that God made male and female. And when you put them both together, you have the full image of God. But we live in a culture today that makes gender absolute. Actually, it's optional. It can be fluid. It can change from one day to the next on how you feel. And I'm not being critical. There are real issues with people that are dealing with their gender. I'm not diminishing that and I'm not being glib. Those are very serious issues and they're difficult. But we live in a culture where gender reveals for babies, I think are going to be politically incorrect in the next five years. Because people are going to be like, no, no, we want to let our baby pick. That's called crazy. In fact, in our culture, they'll tell you, men and women, there's no differences. We're the same. Now, I, I, I don't want to be unkind, but you've got, it, you, you've never lived with the opposite sex. If you can say that with all... I mean, you had to live alone in a cave or with a bunch of people from your own sex. Because I'm telling you, you live with women and you're a guy, we be di we're different. We're crazy different. We're crazy different. The image of God is revealed in gender, male and female. If you want to see the image of God, say, well, God's a male. No, he's not. God reveals himself to us as our heavenly father. But if you want to see the full image of God, you have to look at male and female in humanity. And that's the full image of God. Aren't you glad he didn't stop with making men? Amen. And all the men said, and all the women were like, honey, that was very sweet of you. I hope you said amen really loud before I, man, I set you guys up so many times to hit the ball out of the park. Okay. Second one, God's image is revealed in marriage, husband and wife. People say, well, you know, Jesus just cares about love. It doesn't matter who you love and how you love. It's just all about love. Jesus never said anything about these issues. Well, he actually did. Listen to what he said. And remember, this isn't an arbitrary right and wrong that God just because he's God said, I like this. I don't like that. No. Yes. No. He's talking about his image not being altered. Listen to what Jesus said. And this was actually when the Pharisees, who had a very low regard for marriage, were trying to talk to Jesus about men divorcing their wives without virtually any reason. And Jesus said, haven't you read? At the beginning, the creator. Everyone say the creator. At the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother. That's two genders. And be united to his wife, which is a, that's a woman. And the two shall become one flesh. 
And now they are no longer two, but one. Why? How can they be one? Listen now. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. What does he mean, God joined together? When you join man and woman together, you get the full image of God. And God said, don't separate that. So I believe marriage is this. You can make up whatever you want. You can put blue eyes on Da Vinci, but God made marriage not for just some kind of social experiment. He made marriage so that his image could be revealed in the earth and in the home. And he said, don't separate the image of male and female in marriage. People ask me, will you do same sex marriages? No. Is that because you're against people? No, it's because I won't put blue eyes on the Mona Lisa. Jesus said the creator did this. So let's go on. God's image reproduced. In the book of Malachi, again, he would, they were being chided because of their low, the, the way men were treating women. And they were treating their wives very, very poorly and divorcing them. And it was, and, and they were, and it was, it was difficult. Listen to what, what God said to the people in that day in Malachi 2.15. He said, you were united to your wife by the Lord in God's wise plan. Everyone say God's wise plan. So we're talking about God's wise plan. That get, that's his option. He's God. He's the creator. In God's wise plan, when you married, the two of you became one person in his sight. And what does he want from this? Godly children from your union. Therefore, guard your passions. Keep faith with the wife of your youth. You are made in the likeness and image of God. And I don't think we've ever really contemplated what it means that God has given a man and a woman the power to create a being made in the image of God. It's an amazing thing that we're not a subspecies. When a man and woman come together, he said, I want you to reflect my image because I, you are my image. I want it united in the home, man and a woman. And I want you to have children in that image. And I gave you the power, imagine, to procreate in such a way that it's not a subspecies. They will be made in my likeness and image and well as well. Here's what I want you to, to, to think through. The Bible talks about when you alter the image of God. When you alter God's image, the Bible calls it a false God or an idol. Anytime you, you, you mar God's image, you actually are making a false idol. You're creating a God in your image. That's why the first two commandments in the Bible of the 10, you know that big list of 10? Do you know the first two have to do with respecting the image of God? The first one, you shall have no other gods before me, even the ones you want to make up. Secondly, you shall not make idols. God said, now listen, I am the Lord, I change not. It's not that God's rejecting anybody. It's just he didn't give creation the power to change the creator. And he said, I will have no images before me that don't reflect me. That's an incredible thought if you'll think about it. So redesigning, if you will, sex or marriage or gender or family is actually a re redesigning the image of God. In the Bible, it's called idolatry. Now, why does God reject this? God rejects his image being altered in me simply because he loves you. He loves me. He wants you to experience the life that comes from his full image. And this is so important because anything I add, anything I subtract from the image of God diminishes his loving plan or his 2020 plan for my life. Now, I want to make a statement. I want you to really let this sink in your soul. While God totally will reject his image being altered, he doesn't reject you. Listen to this, please hear this. Human beings, whether they love God or curse God, no matter where they may be broken or where his image is not reflecting in their life, he's desperately in love with humans, all humans. You mean Christians, no, no, no. God loved the world without him. God loves, God is love. It doesn't matter if you, you get up 
24 hours a day for 100 years of your life and use every foul profanity you can imagine toward God and do it 24 hours. That's all you do from the minute you talk. It will not alter God's love for that person that much. Not that much. You see, my brokenness doesn't change his image either. That's why letting his image be revealed in my life changes my brokenness. It's so critically important to grasp this. So let's go back here to Mona. And let's just say that I, again, I'm a little, I think it's a, her hair's a little boring. So I think her highlights in. I want to do, you know, I just want to give, let's just put some highlights in Mona's hair. Because, you know, I, I think she'd look okay with some highlights. So let's just put some highlights on the Mona Lisa here. And we're just going to highlight her up a little bit. And, and we're going to alter the Mona Lisa's hair because, I mean, can I ask, our bangs in. Let's, <laughs> let's, 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 let's give her some bangs. Let's, let's give her some swooping bangs. <laughs> swoop, swoop, swoop. And we'll go a little bit this way. How's that? There we go. There we go. Nice. Her eyebrows are pretty weak. Okay. Now, if I did this at the actual Mona Lisa, somebody right now would be, have tackled me. There would have been a person sent with this to guard it because it's behind bulletproof glass. People would be horrified. I would be all over the news tonight if I went into the Louvre and did this. And yet, the image of God can be marred in man. And people not only, not only, do people accept it, they celebrate it. You don't get to change the image of God. I'm going to read a list of you to things that God rejects. You need to be careful when you hear me. I'm talking about behaviors that change his image in man. And I'm just going to list these things to you. And then we'll clean it up here in a minute. God rejects in totality a human being changing their gender. He totally rejects homosexuality and gay marriage. He totally rejects any sex outside of marriage that is between one man and one woman. He totally rejects the concept of children being born outside of a marriage between one man and one woman. He totally rejects pornography in someone's life, which is self-love without even having another human being made in the image of God. And lastly, do you know God said he absolutely, in the Bible, hates divorce? Now, here's what you heard if you're religious or if you have an image of God that's marred. You heard that I said God hates people that are changing their gender. God hates homosexual people. God hates people that are in a gay marriage. God hates people that are heterosexual, that are having sex outside of the, 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 the image of God. Do you know sex is a reflection of the image of God? It was created by God not by a pornographer. Hugh Hefner didn't come up with sex. He just perverted it. God made sex, and it's designed to show you how intimate he wants his image to be revealed in a relationship. God's not against anybody. God's not, I mean, can I tell you what all of these things have in common? They cause pain. They cause pain to people. If you've been through a divorce, you know that. Why does God hate divorce? Because of what it does to people. Not because of some arbitrary thing that he picked. Because it breaks his image in the home. It's not God's plan. And that's why as a Christian, he wants to have you to fully reflect his image. So that you can live a life made whole. Where you're not being damaged by the culture. In my lifetime... Because of sexuality outside of the image of God, the entire population of Spain today has died. Sexual practices outside of God's image have caused men and women to die at a number that if you were to take it just in my lifetime, would match the population of the nation of Spain right now. 
So it isn't just a game. It's life and death for people. There's a scripture that's been so weaponized against people that I want to read to you. People have one or two things they do with the Bible. They either use it as a weapon to tell people where they're better than them. People who are against people struggling with their gender or their sexuality or maybe they're attracted to the same sex. They seem to never have the same gravity when it comes to heterosexual issues. But it's the same. It's a marring of the image of God. And so people have a tendency to use the Bible as a weapon against people. Or they want to use the Bible to say everything's okay. And both, both are absolutely outside of the image of God and the will of God for men. Let me read these scriptures to you. And this is going to show you that God isn't speaking about people or against behaviors. He's showing you in this scripture how his image cannot be altered. In Romans chapter 1, verse 21 through 23 says this. Yes, they knew God. And he's talking about because of the creation. They knew God, but they would not worship him as God or even give him thanks. Then they began, now listen, to think up foolish ideas of what God was like. As a result, their minds became dark and confused. Claiming to be wise, they instead became utter fools. Instead of worshiping the glorious, ever-living God, they worshiped idols made to look like mere mortal men. God simply saying that when people create a God in their image, they'll come up with every imaginable foolish idea and they'll worship that idea. That will become their God. That will become their, their, their standard for right and wrong. Look at Romans uh, 1 24 says one of the saddest sentences in the Bible. So God abandoned them, permitting them to do whatever shameful things their hearts desired. The religious mind, God abandoned them like you make me sick. I abandon you. What you should hear is the heart of a father. So God had to abandon them to their choices and it broke his heart because he died for those people. And then it said, as a result, they did vile and degrading things with each other's bodies. They traded the truth about God for a lie. So they worshiped and served the thing God created instead of the creator himself, who is worthy of eternal praise. That is why God abandoned them to their shameful desires, even the women turned against the natural way to have sex and instead indulged in sex with each other. And the men, instead of having normal sexual relations with women, burned with lust for each other. Men did shameful things with other men. As a result of the sin, they suffered within themselves the penalty they deserved for their perversion. The religious mind said, see, God said they're perverts. Not what he said. He said that when you make God in your image, it's vile, degrading, and perverse. Anybody today who would look at the Mona Lisa that I... They would say, that's vile. That's degrading. You have perverted the image of Leonardo da Vinci. It isn't about the person. God's saying you're, you're okay, how about this? I, the most critical thing, the most amazing thing about the Mona Lisa that people talk about is her smile, right? But if you look at it, it's kind of flesh toned. And I think in today's world, she should have a little lips, some, some red lips, right? And her lips, you know, we're going to make them a little bit bigger just because, you know, people, I guess, go get those. You know, there we go. Let's give her some nice lips that there we go. And you know what? I just think that kind of in between smile thing. Come on, let's give her a smile. Let's make Mona smile. Come on now. Now, out of all the things to do to mar the image of the Mona Lisa, to do something that mars her smile would absolutely be considered. Oh my gosh, how could you do that? So here's your takeaway today. And I want to take you into something in our last five minutes that if you'll hear it, it will change the way you live your life. God does not reject me. He rejects my image I make of him. God doesn't say people are vile, degrading, and, perversion, and perverse. He said, when you do this to my image, it's vile, degrading, and perverse. So how do I take a next step to have God's image revealed in me? How do I take a next step? When maybe uh, that list I just gave you, I promise you, you're in it or someone you love is in that list. How do I get, how do I get, Lord, how do I, how does your image truly make me whole? 
Remember the takeaway. We need one another to be made whole and fully reflect his image in our life. I want you to see this statement as it comes up on the screen because it's, I want this to reach in your heart today. Please hear this. If you don't experience the unconditional love, the unconditional love of God from people, you will not be able to heal. You will not be able to overcome the power of sin, guilt, and shame. Nor will you experience being transformed into God's image. The reason you're made in the likeness and image of God is so you can reflect his love for people. You will, your brokenness will never, you, you won't get better on your own. You could see a thousand counselors for a thousand years. It's not enough, as, as good as that is. You've got to be with somebody who sees you at your broken point and says, I'm not running. That doesn't make me run away from you. I don't care if, you're, if it's a gender issue, sexuality issue, marriage issue, pornography issue. I don't know what, what the issues are issues. And I'm going to come alongside you and I'm going to love you and we're going to fight this through together. Because until we understand that that's how God sees things, we won't be spiritual people. I want to show you what the Bible defines as spiritual. Galatians 6 verse 1 says this. Brothers, if a man is overtaken, everybody say overtaken. What's that mean? That means kind of captured you, right? Then he, he says, if a man is overtaken in a fault or a sin, you which are spiritual, restore this person, such a person in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, because you can also be tempted. In other words, you're flawed too. Bear and carry one another's burdens, and in doing so, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? To love each other, where? In our perfection? No, in our sin. So that people can open their heart and the image of God in you through the love of God, God, His loving kindness and graciousness, that you come into an environment, that's why small groups are so important, whether it's an activity small group or a small group that's intentionally dealing with these issues like freedom. Michelle and I have gone through it multiple times, 13 weeks ending with this amazing retreat where you unpack your past and the image of God is clarified in your heart. It's amazing. But it's getting with people who find you and you can expose the parts that said, you're no good. You're worthless. This is this bad happened to you. So you're damaged. And here's what he said. A spiritual person does. They carry that burden. They carry the burden of the person who struggles with their gender like it was themselves. If you ever diminish a person for their struggle, you've never had their struggle. Love does what's in the best interest of another. Love puts yourself in the other person's place and says, what if that were me or someone I love? How would I, how would I want someone to help me? And let me tell you this. God is not asking. This is critically important. God is not asking any of us to have the power to change ourselves. If you're dealing with issues that seem to be overtaking your life, I don't know how to, I, how do I change how I feel sexually? You don't, and nor do you even try. So what do I do? You yield to the God who loves you around people that will love you. And you let him make you whole. What do you mean make me whole? Let his image, the Bible said it, we actually grow from faith to faith and glory to glory. It's a process into his image. And when his full image begins to be revealed in my life, guess what happens? The things that have marred that image, even in my feelings, he will deal with. He will deliver you from. But so many people say, well, I try. I ask God to change me. It's not how it works. You have to yield to this person. Truly spiritual people will love in the deepest sin of another. So Pastor John, I don't know people like that. Well, then you don't know anybody spiritual. That's why over and over again, you'll hear me talk about we exist as a church to reveal the, the simple fact that God loves everybody unconditionally. That's why we exist. Because it's the only place where your life can change. The goodness of God, the Bible said, leads men to repentance. Do you know Jesus said that all men will know you're my disciples or followers by the way you love. That you'll love people, not pretending that the image of God marred is okay. See, it's deception to say, this is okay. It's not okay. 
but it is so against the heart of God to say, Mona, until you change, get lost. It's not how it works. Jesus said, you wanna, you wanna find out how people will know you follow me? Love people, be kind to people. No matter what their fight is, no matter what their struggle is, give them the love you freely received, you give it to them and fight through life together. I wanna to pray for you today and my, my prayer is that every one of us in this room will truly trust God and take off the mask. Join with other people and be loved into his image. Small groups, if you think of it as an option, you're really in a place of deception because here's the reality. My body doesn't get healed independently of my body. My finger's injured, you don't cut it off over here and let it get better. I'll stick it back on when it gets better. It gets better if it's in the body. And as you relate to other believers and they reflect the image of God and they start to tell you who you really are, no matter how you feel. And while you feel differently, they love you. While you fail, they love you. While you're overtaken in brokenness, they love you. While you're overtaken in sin, they love you. And you love them. The image of God begins to be, to grow in you and it breaks the power of what's been broken because you're made whole. So my hope today is no matter where you find yourself in this circle of, of humanity, brokenness, that you realize that God's not against you. He's desperately in love with you. And he has a plan for his image to make you whole, no matter what your issue is. He simply says, do not make an idol and cast me though in your image. Do you see the, the balance there between grace and truth? So let me pray for every one of us today, because this applies to every one of our lives. Father, I thank you that every one of us here today have to deal with issues in our life of brokenness. Father, I pray that no matter where people find themselves today, whether for themselves or maybe family, no matter how significant the issue may be in their life, no matter how impossible it may feel, help them to realize that you won't run from them. Help us to trust you enough to love, be loved by you, to yield to you, but not just yield to you, but yield to the love of God revealed in your image through men and women, that we would be able to reveal that love to others so that we can see our, 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 the people that we love and those that we serve to be made whole. And we give you the praise and the honor for it because if there's any change in me, if there's any good in me, if there's any freedom in me, it came from Jesus because he came to make me free. And I pray that freedom on every person here under the sound of my voice. With every head remaining bowed and every eye closed, I wanna make certain before we go one more moment in this service today, that you've given, you've had the opportunity to give your life to Christ, the one who gave his life for you, to give your life to Jesus, the one who died on a cross for you. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you'd say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever given my life to Christ. I try to be a good person. I, I go to church, I'm religious, or I've, been, I have a, I've, I've received the sacrament of, sacrament of my church. All those things are wonderful, but none of those make you right with God. All of those are things you do. If there's anything good, there's only one way to him. And he paid that price that you could never pay. And when you receive Christ into your life, he makes you brand new in the image of God in you restored on the inside. It's an amazing way to live. So if you're here and you've never accepted Christ into your life or you're not sure, you say, I want to know that I'm going to heaven when I die. I want to turn from that other, those other images and I want his image in me to be fully revealed and restored. With every head bowed, every eye closed, right where you're seated, I'll pray for you. In a moment, I'll ask you to raise your hand and then we as a church will pray that prayer out loud and together with you. With heads bowed and eyes closed, say, Pastor, please include me in that prayer. Lift your hand, do it right now. Do it right now. And I'm gonna pray for you. Don't be ashamed of this. I'm not gonna embarrass you. Lift your hand right now if you wanna receive Christ. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. God bless you. Thank you, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, sir. You can put your hands, thank you, thank you. You can put your hands back down, thank you. Listen, if you raised your hand or you should have, please pray this where you hear it with your own ears. Jesus will come into your heart. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. You keep coming back. And you take next steps with God. And you let the love of God change your life. It changes everything. If you raised your hand or should have, pray this out loud where you hear it with your own ears. And we'll pray it with you. Say it where you hear it. Say, Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. 
Jesus died for my sins. He paid a debt I couldn't pay. So I opened the door of my life and heart. And Jesus, I receive you now to be the Lord and Savior of my life. Thank you for coming. I am now a child of God. My sin is wiped away. I am heaven bound. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give him a hand, would you? Best decision of your life. Would you stand together with me before we go our way today? I want to sing a song. We're going to raise a hallelujah in the presence of our enemies. We're going to proclaim that what God says about us is true. Because everything God says about you is true. Every part of the image of God in you is greater than how you feel. Greater than how, what it looks like in your life. Greater than what it looks like in the lives of the people that you love. God wants to do something great in your soul right now. Let him do it. Lift your voice. Forget about everything around you. And you proclaim that I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. My God is for me, not against me. He loves me. Come on, let's worship him. I raise being the Holy Spirit just so strongly spoke to my heart. There are no walls that God respects. There are no issues that are too big for him to love you. Feeling stuck is part of life. Being overtaken in a fault or a sin or a weakness or a failure or a place where you've been hurt is human. But he never lets go of you. He never gives up on you. No matter what you're facing, he's not rejecting you. He's not against you. Don't believe the lies you may have heard of religion. He loves you. He loves you. He loves your children more than you do. He, listen to me, this is about the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart. For people in this room trusting God for your kids, you don't have to convince him to love your children. He loves them more than you do. You just need to cooperate with that love and be led and pray over them and let the Father love them into life. Father, I pray for every person here today that feels stuck, that, that is broken, or whatever has come against them. Help us to truly raise a hallelujah in the presence of an enemy, that we will trust you no matter what it looks like. We will walk by faith and not by sight. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.